So I already said a little bit about N-Wave earlier today, and now I'm going to bore you at slightly greater length, um, so stick with me. So just to give a little bit of background, some of it possibly superfluous, the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything opens up enormous possibilities. Um, but in order to be able to get the benefits of this Internet of Things, we need to be able to get the data out of all these possible sources into these intelligent back-end systems, data analytics, um, data mining programs, and so forth. So the challenge has been that you've got ways of moving small amounts of data or big amounts of data in a localized area. In fact, Nicola was talking about this just now. Um, but there are people who want to move small amounts of data over large distances using very little power. Um, you've got GSM, but it's really power hungry. Um, and also, it's pretty inefficient. If you want to send one byte of information, useful information, on top of that, you're sending 499 bytes of useless information, handshakes, acknowledgments, and so on. Also, the OPEX is pretty huge if you're um, sending people out into the field to change the batteries if it's not connected to mains power. Um, then you've got other connectivity solutions. They're short range, or they're complex, or they're costly. So what you need is something which is long range, but it's low power. Now, various figures come out there, but the potential market size for a low power wide area technology like this is 15 and a half billion devices by 2020. Whether that's realistic or not is really high than neither here nor there, because if we get three or four billion, it's already an enormous number. So in any way, we feel that we've solved this connectivity gap. We've got communications technology that is long range. When I say long range, I don't mean a few hundred meters, but up to 10 kilometers in urban areas. And that's providing internal coverage inside buildings, also from buried devices and devices behind walls. It's also low power, 100 times less power than GSM or GPRS. This means that you can have a device out in the field transmitting four times a day, operating off a single AA battery for 10 years. Now imagine what you could do with that if you don't have to go out and maintain these devices. Suddenly, the, the promise of a digitized landscape with hundreds of thousands or millions of devices talking from in field suddenly becomes possible. So a little bit about the network architecture. It's very simple. It's a star architecture. It's devices communicating directly up to a base station. Each base station can provide a network cell serving hundreds of thousands of devices. These can communicate pretty much simultaneously. There's little or no risk of interference or jamming. Um, this is then backhauling into the cloud through our telecom servers into other people's enterprise applications um, and into consumer-facing apps. So we don't just provide technology. We want to make it possible for people to actually deploy solutions. And we're trying to make this as easy as possible. So we've got our own silicon that we've designed and get other people to make. But as I mentioned earlier, we're silicon agnostic, which means that our protocol can be ported onto devices that already exist. Um, it also means that people can buy off-the-shelf off silicon to put into their devices. In the middle, there's what we call our universal IoT modem. Um, that can be connected up to pretty much any analog or digital device to make it smart to talk over our network. And this is a very cheap, ruggedized device. Um, it can operate in pretty much any climate. It's got a long-life battery in there, a PCB antenna. And we've got these connected up to utilities meters, environmental sensors, agricultural sensors, water level sensors, health monitors, you name it. And then people can take this and do their own thing. And at the bottom there is the base station. Um, in fact, we've got a new generation of those coming out. It's ruggedized. It's smaller than a shoebox. You can put it straight on top of a building. So you don't need a rack room or a dustproof environment. We also have the back-end systems. Um, we've got the network monitoring and management tools um, and the device management tools. And as well as that, we're looking at vertical markets because we believe that it's one thing rolling out networks, but you need to show people that they work. Um, there are some applications out there that we feel justify network rollouts on their own. Transport's a massive issue at the moment, so we've developed our own electromagnetic parking sensor. It goes into each parking space, detects uh, parking events, transmits that data in real time, 
back into cloud applications that enable people to manage their parking enforcement more, um, more eff efficiently and deals with problems that are really facing large urban communities the world over. Um, as you can see here, 30% of urban congestion is caused by people looking for a parking space. That's really, sim uh, really serious. Population growth, ever-rising car ownership. 40% um, of parking revenue is not captured. Now imagine what a council could do if they were capturing that money um, and putting it into other services to improve people's communities. It's also hitting the bottom lines of businesses um, and, and spoiling our environment. We have a web application on top of that, um, and we already have integrated our platform with other people providing some really smart driver-facing apps. So we work on hardware sales for device enablement and network deployment. We got a really low per device subscription charge. We don't want this to be a technology that people can't afford. So the idea is it's for high density endpoint deployments, driving that subscription charge down to a few pence a month. And we provide the data aggregation, device and network management tools to make that possible. We can't do this on our own. We can't have vertical expertise across the board. Um, and we can't provide the enterprise level solutions that are going to give comfort to the sort of big names that we, can, we want to work with and work with already. So you'll see we've got some big names in there, people we're working with. There are also technology partners, people like Farsight Communications putting our technology into smart bins, Critical Data putting our technology into home he healthcare monitoring solutions, uh, companies like Stream who are taking the complexity out of offering IoT connectivity to people by aggregating the different offerings and providing a single entry point for people who want to deploy multi-layer IoT solutions. So what makes us different in the environment that we're playing in? Um, obviously, it's very easy to say, oh yeah, we're truly scalable. Um, I have a particular company in mind here when I'm talking about how truly scalable we are, but one of the virtues of our ultra narrow band protocol is that it um, allows one to have tens of thousands of simultaneous transmissions while still avoid avoiding interference and jamming, something you can't get with some of the broadband based protocols. We also feel that the importance of standards in this growing nascent IoT market is absolutely crucial. Um, the other players at the moment are providing proprietary technologies which traditionally tend to get stacked in vertical silos and don't achieve widespread global adoption. By opening up our technology and allowing developers worldwide to develop their own applications, devices and potentially their own base station infrastructure, we're able to tap into an enormous wealth of developer talent worldwide and make this a technology that's accessible for everyone that can really bring benefits to us all. And once again, as I pointed out with our parking, we're trying to solve real problems. We're not just building networks and hoping that people will come. We're building networks where they're needed. We're not waiting for large infrastructure companies to do national deals with us. If you've got a problem in Ghana and you need it solved, we will come and do it for you. Ghana's just a random example. But if anyone does, you know, talk to me afterwards. So um, we were set up in 2012. However, it's an idea that we'd been sort of ruminating on for some time. Um, in 2013, we had our first big deployment, which was a network in Moscow to support a, a third-party parking sensor solution, which we gained, obviously, a lot of experience and knowledge from. We moved on to connecting utilities meters, and we've been working with a number of utilities companies since then. Um, in the UK last year, we deployed our network in Milton Keynes. We've this year got a network in Cambridge, another one going up this month in London. Um, we've got projects in the US, technology partners I already mentioned. Um, and very importantly, this year we're also releasing our bi-directional base station, so we will have bi-directional communications allowing simultaneous uplink and downlink sessions. And we're also releasing our evaluation board and SDK once again in order to open this up to allow people to take the technology and run with it. Um, the risk of repeating myself, I think I've said all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you.